Hello and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm Claudia and this is my ultimate Jane Austen novel ranking. Yes, today I will be telling you the order in which I rank Jane Austen's main six novels. And I'm willing to bet it's not exactly the same as yours. I say that because every time I watch a Jane Austen novel ranking, it's never the exact same order as mine. What's interesting about these videos is there's always so much discussion underneath them because everyone has got different favorites and everyone has got different novels that they dislike. So I'm just preparing myself for all of the Mansfield Park fans. I can take it. I don't think this needs saying, but this entire video will be full of spoilers for Jane Austen's main six novels. If you have not read all six novels, this is probably not the video for you. Instead, if you're new to Jane Austen, I recommend a much nicer, a much more positive video I made, Where to Start with Jane Austen, and that will be linked in the description box. Without further ado, let's get into the ranking. I'm going to be moving from place number six. In last place is, as you've already guessed, Mansfield Park. The one Jane Austen novel I truly dislike, and I have given it a second chance. In fact, I recorded my experience of reading Mansfield Park for the second time, which made for a 40-minute video of me trying to understand why people love this book so much. That video will be linked in the description box if you're interested in seeing me suffer for 40 minutes straight. To be fair, I understand the literary merits of Mansfield Park. I get that it is a very sophisticated novel. It touches on many interesting ideas and many things, many themes that Jane Austen did not talk about any of her other work, but I genuinely dislike every single character in the book. The Crawford siblings have got their advantages. I would have preferred the novel much more if it had actually focused on them, if they were the main characters in this book instead of Fanny Bloody Price, the blandest, the most boring, the most insufferable of Austen's heroines. And yes, 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 I can see you typing away about how she's very good and about how she's so misunderstood and she's very observant and she's very steadfast. Whatever, I don't care. I genuinely dislike her. Every time she's on the page, I'm bored. And again, objectively, I can see that she's a good person and I'm sure she deserves... Actually, that's not true. She doesn't deserve Edmund Bertram. She deserves much better than him. Edmund Bertram is the worst of all Jane Austen's love interests. He ignores Fanny Price for about 97% of the book, yet we are somehow supposed to believe that these two are made for each other. I don't know. It's just... Ugh. The characters of this are so drab. The story itself, again, it is technically the most scandalous of Austen's novel. It's the one novel where we actually have an adulteress, where we actually have some scandal happening. And yet, it's so dull. So Mansfield Park, the one novel I actually don't like of Jane Austen's. I see the literary merits. I sort of understand why some people enjoy it, but it's just not for me. I'm sure that one day I will have forgotten about just how much I suffered rereading this book and I will read it again, but I'm hoping that they won't be for many, many years. So Mansfield Park, dead last place, the only Jane Austen novel I didn't really enjoy at all. In fifth place, and this I don't think is a very controversial opinion, in fifth place is Sense and Sensibility. And this is one Jane Austen novel where I believe that my experience of the book has been affected by my favorite film adaptation of it, which is the one from the 1990s. Because every time I approach the book, I think it's better than it actually is. And then when I reread it, I, I'm reminded that, yeah, actually this is quite a clumsy novel. I still enjoy it. It's definitely not as insufferable as Mansfield Park. I enjoy reading the book. The characters of Marianne and Elena Dashwood are interesting main characters. I think the comic relief characters are fun and I really enjoy the sort of cottage setting of it. Of course some of the book takes place in London but uh, the majority of it is set in this really interesting romantic landscape that plays a much bigger part in the book than um, landscape does in many other Austen novels. So I like Sense and Sensibility. 
but every time I read it I'm left with a sense of disappointment. The romance wasn't as sophisticated as in the later novels. The plot is not quite as uh, well thought out. The book isn't as tightly written. Most of all, I dislike the romantic relationships that we get in this book, particularly Brandon and Marianne and between Elena and Edward Ferrers. The, the couples just seem a little bit mismatched. And I talk about this a little bit more actually in a video I did where I ranked Jane Austen's romances that will be linked down below as well if you want to hear my thoughts about why I don't think that Brandon and Marianne or indeed Eleanor and Edward are the perfect couple. So overall Sense and Sensibility is a fun novel to revisit because uh, of the setting and you know it, it is still very typical Jane Austen writing and therefore I enjoy those aspects of it the back and forth uh, in the parlour rooms, the drama and the scandal and the letters and the misunderstandings and the evil matrons and the mean girls and the rakes. You know, you get all of the things that make a Jane Austen novel great, but in Sense and Sensibility they're just not as finely worked out as in some of the other works. Moving up to number four, a novel that really should be higher up, but now we're getting into fourth place, there really isn't that much difference between the novels in the way that I regard them. So in fourth place is a novel that I will admit should be higher up, but I just don't love it as much as the top three. And that is, I'm gonna brace myself here, Persuasion. Persuasion is a novel that I only just reread and loved. In a way it's the opposite of Sense and Sensibility in that it is very finely honed, very crafted, very just very well written. Stylistically it's amazing, narratively it's amazing. It is so different from the other Jane Austen novels because of our heroine being a little bit more mature, you know, Anne Elliot being all of 27 years old, practically an old spinster, but it doesn't get me emotionally as much as the other novels that are higher up in the list. With the exception, of course, of the letter scene. I, I nearly cried when I read the letter scene this time. Just that single chapter is probably the punchiest, most emotionally written chapter in all of Austen's work. And that one chapter kind of saves the novel for me because that is just so beautiful, so romantic, so heartfelt, so heartbreaking. And I wish that that sort of emotion had been more obvious in the rest of the novel. I get why it's not. Persuasion is a book about emotion bubbling under the surface, about reconnecting and suppressing feelings and all of that stuff. Technically it is absolutely brilliant, but every time I think about Persuasion I just don't have that same connection to it as I do with the three novels in the top three. Persuasion, famously Jane Austen's last novel, kind of a shame, would have loved to see in which direction her writing would have developed next, but because Persuasion gives us a hint already at a more serious tone of writing and a novel where the societal criticism that we all enjoy in Jane Austen's writing, where that takes a sharper turn, where that's a bit more obvious, a bit more direct. In Persuasion, Jane Austen criticizes the aristocracy more than in any other novel and uh, we get a sort of sense of modernity in the book that we don't really get in the earlier works. Definitely appreciate Persuasion for what it is and I understand that this is many people's favourite Jane Austen novel, totally get that, it just is not mine. Now we're moving into the top three and in third place is actually Jane Austen's very first novel Northanger Abbey. I very recently reread that as well, in fact, at the same time as I reread Persuasion. And the difference between the two Bath novels could not be greater, where Persuasion is serious and melancholy and calm. Northanger Abbey is exuberant and lively and excited, just like its main character, Catherine Morland, who's just loving the adventure that she's on. That's probably why I like Northanger Abbey just a little bit more than Persuasion. I like the liveliness, I like the heart of it, 
I like the adventure, the sense of actually being told a story. Northanger Abbey plays with the very medium of the novel, it plays with the very tropes of storytelling and it gives us a heroine who is in some way aware of the fact that she is the heroine in a novel or at least she likes to imagine that she is. But of course she actually is because she literally is in a book. It's so meta. You can almost feel the fun that Jane Austen had with playing with all of these levels of storytelling. But even if we just look at the story itself, it's a fun coming of age tale. You have a teenage girl going into the big city, away from her family for the first time, experiencing all of these things, meeting all of these new peoples and having a lot of fun while learning a few lessons along the way and actually growing into her own self and learning to communicate with people and understand people throughout the novel. Northanger Abbey is a short little book but it really packs a punch. It's strange that that is the novel that was actually written before Sense and Sensibility because I think it reads much more sophisticated. The writing, the style itself is much punchier, much sharper than in Sense and Sensibility. The humour is just more funny. The book is absolutely hilarious and the author takes some very sharp digs at various groups of people and at various opinions at the time. What I love about this in particular is the passionate defence of books, literature and novels in particular and the passionate defence of readers. Northanger Abbey is, in my opinion, Jane Austen's most underrated novel. It deserves to be spoken about as more than just her immature juvenile work because I really think that there is more to the book than that. Now we get into the top two and I love them both. Since this is a ranking and we have to decide, I'm going to have to give place number two to Emma. This is a love it or hate it kind of a book, I think. Emma is usually on people's rankings, either near the top or near the bottom. And I understand why. It's a very long book. There is a lot of waffle in there, okay? I, I'm not denying that Emma could have done with another round of editing. But the waffle is delightful to read. In particular, the over-the-top comedic characters of the book. Miss Bates, who goes on for page after page after page, just boring everyone in her vicinity. But her sort of waffle, her talking is so entertaining in itself. You've got the Eltons there, the absolutely insufferable sort of hipster couple of the neighbourhood. Mr Woodhouse, who's so concerned about his own and everyone's health that he gets on your nerves just reading about him trying to deny people cake. The world of Emma is really brought alive in the book. You get a real sense of the uniqueness of the individual characters in it and it has to be written that way because Emma is set in this in this one village in this one location where in Jane Austen's other novels the characters travel at least somewhat but Emma does not go out of her village of Highbury throughout the entire novel. People come and go, people come to visit but she remains stationary and therefore the place itself has to be written with such detail and such love that we as the reader are also content to stay in Highbury and I think that Jane Austen has really achieved that. Apart from that I like that Emma is the most sort of mystery-like novel because there are characters that we just don't quite understand in the beginning. What's the deal with Jane Fairfax? What's the deal with the mysterious Frank Churchill? Even down to little things like, well, who is Harriet Smith's actual father? So there's all of these questions, there's a lot of some detective work going on, there's a lot of misdirection and clues. And um, I spoke about this in a previous video once and someone just sort of commented saying, I got the mystery straight away or something like that. Congratulations, aren't you clever? But for me, the mystery aspect of Emma, even on a reread, is what drives the plot, even though I know the answer, even though I know what the deal is with Jane Fairfax. Um, it's still forward motion that gets me through the plot and that makes me enjoy the book every single time. Another thing that I really enjoy about Emma, and I realised 
this is probably not up there for every reader. But I really like the discourse on music in Emma. It plays a really big role who performs music. For example, the Broadwood piano that Jane Fairfax mysteriously gets as a present. You know, there's, there's a lot of little plot elements where you get that Jane Austen knew her music and that that knowledge is worked into the novel in a really clever way. I wanted to make a video about this, uh, this Jane Austen July, but uh, I didn't get to. I've got a half ready script for that video, so I guess you can expect that next year in Jane Austen July, unless I get it done before then. There's a lot of thought that's put into these little details of music, but also other things, food and health. Oh, there's just so much in Emma that uh, it makes this really big book quite rich in detail. Uh, so that I personally don't get bored reading through those hundreds of pages. And I haven't even touched on the main character herself. Emma is possibly the most flawed of Jane Austen's heroines. That's what makes her so interesting. She is snobby and privileged and insensitive to a degree that we don't get to see other Jane Austen heroines being. She has to get over her own insecurities and she has to learn a big lesson or two throughout the novel. Yeah, there's a lot to Emma and a lot to discover on every single read of it and much more than I've even just talked about in this video. I just love it. And now we get to my very uncontroversial number one. I think this is probably on top of more rankings than not. It is my absolute favorite Jane Austen novel, Pride and Prejudice. What else could be the number one spot? Pride and Prejudice is as close to perfection in a novel as any book can get. It has everything that makes for a fantastic story. It has a really compelling main character who lives in an environment that is also interesting to read about. Elizabeth Bennet. Over the centuries, we think of her as almost an archetype of a main character. You know, she's witty, she's clever, she's confident. She's, of course, flawed, and she's not in the place that she wants to be in in life. If we look at it now from 2020, one, we're like, yeah, yeah, we know that kind of a character. It's, it's kind of a, an archetype of a main character. But within the works of Jane Austen, she is unique. There's no other main character in Austen's work that is like Elizabeth Bennet. There is no romantic hero that is like Mr. Darcy. The two of them, the way that they play against each other, the tension between them is there from the moment he's introduced. But there is more to the novel than that. Every character has their place within the story, with the one exception of Kitty Bennett, because she may as well not be there, let's be honest. Even that's not true, because the reason for Kitty Bennett is to show how Lydia Bennett, despite being the youngest sister, has this kind of charm, this kind of charisma. Kitty Bennett, I guess, has a function, but she is probably the least substantial of uh, characters in Pride and Prejudice. Other than that, Every person has their function and every person is unique and distinct from other people, even people that we don't really think about when we think of Pride and Prejudice. I think we all have learned to appreciate characters like Lady Catherine, like Charlotte Lucas, like Mrs. Bennet, like George Wickham, of course. But think about characters like Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner. They are only in a small part of the book and yet they are so perfectly written that we have an idea of them. We know what they are like, we know their personalities, we know their station in life, and they have a clear function in the novel as well. Think of someone like Colonel Fitzwilliam, who again is only a very small part of the book, and yet he has a distinct personality. Uh, when we get the scenes with him and with Mr. Darcy at... What's Lady Catherine's residence called? Bill, what's the house called that Lady Catherine de Bourgh lives in in Pride and Prejudice? Can you ask Alexa? Alexa, what house does Catherine de Bourgh live in? Does she know? No. All right. I haven't got a phone here to Google it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Rosings. What was I talking about? When Colonel Fitzwilliam and Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth are all at Rosings, you get that tension between 
Darcy and Elizabeth that is amped up by the presence of Colonel Fitzwilliam. Colonel Fitzwilliam is on a few pages in maybe one or two chapters of Pride and Prejudice and yet he leaves an impression. You can say the same thing about what you think of as inconsequential characters like Mariah Lucas, Georgiana Darcy. Every character feels unique and is placed in exactly the right place. The plot of Pride and Prejudice it's really hard to summarize because there is a lot to it. There's a lot of different plot lines that cross over. Um, there's a huge web of kind of actions that influence other things that happen in the novel. I mean, it is just so masterfully plotted. There is just so much to the novel. On every single reread, I discover something new. The humor is as sharp as in any other Austen novel. And all of that mix, it's, you know, the romance, the mystery, the humour, the societal criticism, the unique characters. It's just a big mix that make Pride and Prejudice an absolutely perfect novel and one that I will gladly reread and reread and reread again. I don't think this is ever going to be toppled from the top spot. Maybe the rest of my ranking is going to change over the years. We'll see. If it does, I'll update you. But Pride and Prejudice is going to stay on number one. So that was my ranking of Jane Austen's main six novels. If my ranking happens to be exactly the same as yours, do let me know, because I'd, I'd like to know this. If not, uh, tell me where we agree, tell me where we disagree, tell me why I'm a horrible person for disliking Mansfield Park. Thank you for watching. Bye!